Okay. So today we'll be talking about uh, two subjects. First of all, profiling. And profiling is all about finding the slow parts in your Python program. So basically finding bottlenecks in your Python implementation. And then the second part will be mixed programming. And so in particular, I will show you how you can in increase the speed of your Python program using Cython, which is a mix between Python and C. But let's start with profiling. So basically, I would like to show you three different ways how you can profile your program. The first is with timing. So adding simple timer, time statements in your program. The second one is profiling. There we will use the, C, uh, the profile and the C profile module that comes with Python. And then finally, I want, would like to show you a line-by-line -line profiling tool. But most importantly, before you start worrying about speed in your Python program, you need to make sure that you actually implement the correct thing. So there's one famous saying by Ken Beck saying, first make it work, then make it right, in the sense of correct, and then make it fast. Okay? So the optimization step should really be the last part of an implementation before you made sure that everything actually works as you expect it to. And before we can start optimizing our code, we, we need to figure out which parts of our code is slow. Right? There's no point in optimizing uh, parts of the code that don't contribute um, to the total runtime. And so this lecture now will be focused on identifying which parts of the code take most of the time when you run your program. And so, in general, uh, profiling is not just about one time, but it can be used to measure all kinds of resources in your, in your Python program. So for example, typically one of the most common resources that you're interested in is CPU time. Right? You, want, you want that your program finishes as quickly as possible. But maybe your program uses massive amount of RAM. Maybe you're running out of memory when you run the program. And in this case, you can also use profiling to figure out which parts of the program use how much RAM and identify the, the parts of the program that use most of the RAM and try and reduce it. You can even try and profile metrics like the disk input output. So which parts of the program write or read massive amount of data to, to disk? Or maybe if, you have, if you're implementing a network program, you, you're interested in how much network input output is being produced by parts of the program. And so generally, when you profile your program, the most important thing is that you start simple. So start with the simplest techniques that you can, that we have. And then if that doesn't solve the issue, then we can use more complex uh, techniques. And so in particular, when we are interested in one time of our program, we have three techniques, uh, three typical techniques. The first one is um, manual timing, which I will show you in a second. Then the second one is the time it module, which I will also talk about. And then the last one is profile, this profile and the C profile modules. Okay, so to make this a bit interesting, let's look at a case study that we want to, um, where we want to improve our um, implementation. So imagine we have a rectangular grid, grid in this shape, a 2D grid, and we would like to create a numpy array A which holds function values on each node on that grid. So after we've created this numpy array, we can ask what is the function value on the index ij um, of this numpy array, and it will return me the function value at this specific point. Okay. So how would we implement something like this? Here we go. 
we create a new class that represents our two-dimensional grid. And when we initialize this grid, we can pass in optional arguments where we specify the x, the starting x point and the ending x point, and the starting y point and the starting uh, the ending y position, and a step sizing in the grid. Right, so these are the typical arguments that we have for a rectangular grid. And then we use the A range method that comes in NumPy to create an array, an equally dist uh, an array of the nodal positions of the coordinates, of the x coordinates, of the x coordinates and the y coordinates equally distributed, okay, by our step size dx and dy. So now self dot x core and self dot y core contains the x and y coordinates of the grids. And so now a typical implementation of our grid loop of to where we want to compute now the function values at all the nodal points is that we pass in the function um, as an argument to grid loop. Then we figure out how many x coordinates we have and how many y coordinates we have. And we create an array that we initialize with zeros that has the same shape as Lx and Ly. So we have a two-dimensional array with the sum number of x coordinates and the number of y coordinates as the shape. And then we loop over all the indices and the x coordinates, extract the, ex the actual x coordinate at that index, do the same thing for the, for the y coordinate, and then assign the, the update the array at the index ij with the function value, the function evaluated at that coordinate, uh, at these coordinates. So we loop over all the points, evaluate the function at the points, update our array, and when we're done, we return the two-dimensional array. Okay? So how can we now use this? We can create a new grid by writing g equals grid 2d. We provide a step length for dx and a step length from, for, for dy. Um, and then we can compute grid values. So the way what I do is I create my own function that I want to have evaluated. In this case, it's the sinus function of the x coordinate times the y coordinate plus the y coordinate. So this is now just a normal Python function. And now I can call g.grid loop and I pass in the function as an argument and it will return me an array. And so now this is our implementation and I can I run it and it takes some time and then I get the, the results out. And now if I'm interested at the grid value at a specific point, what I can do is I can specify the index, the i, the I index and the j index and then just mm, get the coordinates of the ith, uh, the, uh, the ith coordinate, x coordinate, and the jth y coordinate, and the function value at the index i and j using the A array. Right? And now this will be, this will, in this case, it's the function value 1, 1, and it will tell me this, this is the function value. Okay, let's see how fast this program is. And the easiest way how you can measure that is by use the time.time .time function in Python. And basically time.time .time returns the current wall clock time, right? It's just the, 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 the current wall clock time. And so the idea is simple. Before we start our code execution, we get the current time, then we run the code, and then we get, after we've run the code, we get the time again. And then the runtime run is just the time after running the code minus the time before running the code. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. So one thing we should uh, keep in mind when we use this technique, mm, if we have simple statements, then we should uh, place, place them in a loop so that we test them many, many times because the, the machine, the mach so this time here has only a certain resolution. So you can only measure a few milliseconds. And so 
if the code here doesn't use a significant amount of time, let's say one second or two seconds, then the one time that you get out might not be very accurate. And then it's worth to execute this code a few times so that you get a significant one time. Also, you should make sure that your machine isn't load, isn't busy with other things, right? Maybe you're, uh, if, you're, if you're already compiling a program in the background, then the, one t then the CPU is busy and the runtime won't be a representative. And so generally, it's a good idea to run this test here multiple times and then pick the fastest runtime that you have achieved, right? And so this, in some way, avoids the problem of the machine loading. Okay, so just as a remark, so this time.time .time function measures the wall clock time, but you can also use time.clock, which will actually measure the CPU time. So time.clock will return you the amount of time that has been, the amount of CPU time that the program has used up. Okay, so there's two different ways how you can actually measure time <coughs> in a program. Okay, so let's try to time our case study, our 2D grid. We basically have two, um, two parts of our programs that could be slow. The first one is the initialization of our grid. So remember in the initialization, we created these large num numpy arrays with the x coordinates and the y coordinates. So potentially, they could be slow. It right? might be a good idea to measure them. And then the second one is this um, grid loop function where we need to loop over all the, all the nodes and call, the, call our function. So that's the second part that we uh, should probably time. And so we time these separately in order to figure out how much time is spent in each of them. Let's start with the, with the grid 2D initialization. So here's my Here's my simple time, timing solution. I import the time module, and then I create a loop. So here I perform the, the timing experiment four times, just to make sure that I, that I can take the minimum of four values. Then I start the timer. I initialize the grid with my desired values here. Then I stop the timer, and I just print out how, how long the experiment uh, took. And so now we can run this. And we can see we get, we have three experiments here. And you can see how the CPU time, or this is actually the wall clock time that is being spent, differs between all three experiments, right? So quite significantly, the first one was the slowest, then the second one was a bit, quite a bit faster, and then the last one was the fastest, okay? And so we'll take the minimum, so this one is the one that is our reference solution, and it's 3.6 times 10 to the minus 5 seconds, which is, which is much, much, uh, which is very small. So the overall one time of this program is about um, 3, 4 seconds. So we can conclude that this initialization part did, does not contribute so much to the total one time. So let's see what the grid loop function does. So I've done the same thing here, the same loop. We repeat the experiment uh, three times, and now I just call the grid loop function and I pass in with the my func that we want to. Oops. Yes. So I just need to run this. Okay, there we go. So you're running the experiments three times. And yeah, so here we can see we actually use significant amount of time. It's all about 1.5 to two seconds. So again, the, the one time differs quite significantly between the experiments. And the first one is about 1.52 seconds. Right? So, okay, we can, we can say the grid loop function is the one that is probably that contributes most uh, to the runtime. Okay, so this manual implementation is 
there, there's a nicer way of doing it, and you can you can use the time it, time it module to do that. So basically, the time it module is just a convenient way for measuring the CPU time of small code snippets. So it's a it's a nicer way of measuring time than doing it manually the way I've just shown you. And the way it works is following. You import time it, the time it module, and then you can call the time it function with a statement, and this statement is the one that you want to test. And you can also use a setup function that should be called before you start running the statements. Okay? So here in this, in this example, we test how long does it take to execute the statement where we in increment the, um, the A value. And so we can run this, and we can figure out, OK, the incrementing the A value takes roughly 0.07 seconds. We can also, mm, we can also add the number argument here which will execute the statement multiple times. And so we can do that as well. And so, okay, so I don't actually know what the default value here is when we call time it. But so as far as I know the time it, if you provide this number argument here, then what you get out is the accumulated time that is being spent here. So calling number 10,000 times tells us that um, the total runtime is 0 0.0006 seconds, okay? And so, so yeah, I remember now. So if you call it without the number argument here, time it will just choose a reasonable number um, that should be repeated in here. So okay, so we can use the number to, perf to um, execute our statement multiple times, so basically put it in a for loop. We can also use the repeat, the time it dot repeat function if we want to repeat the, the, the experiment multiple times. And so this will allow us to, again, um, this is this effect that we should always repeat our experiment multiple times and then take the minimum. Okay? So in this case, I repeat the experiment five times I get five different values, and I'm supposed to take the minimum when I measure the time. So as mentioned, um, time it automatically wraps your code in a for loop and executes the statement multiple times. And um, I've also mentioned that you have different times, uh, different measuring techniques on how you can measure um, time on the computer. One is the wall clock time, so the time that is actually being measured on your wall. And the other one is the, is the CPU time. And you can see, so here's an example how you can see the difference between the two. So I execute, my testing statement here is just sleep one, which basically just lets the computer wait for a second. And I measure the statement in two different ways. First, I use the wall clock time. So I use this timer argument here to time it, to specify uh, the time, time dot time, which is the wall top climb. And then in the second experiment, I use the time dot clock, which measures, measures the CPU time that is spent in the program. And now if we execute these two, we'll see with the wall clock time here, we see that calling sleep dot one takes exactly one second. Okay, but if I use the CPU time, then you realize that the, the measured time is actually uh, only a fraction of the second. And that's because there's not, no CPU time being used when I call sleep.1, right? It, the CPU is just waiting in the background and it's not actually using CPU time. So this is something that you need to be aware when you measure, measure time. Also be aware that this time it modu module isolates the global namespace. So in the statement here, you can't use variables that you defined previously in your program, or at least not by default. If you want to do it, you need to import 
the statements in the setup routine. So for example here, if I wanted to test my statement grid loop here, I would have, I would, uh, I need to report both G, the object G, and the my func um, in the setup script so that they're, that they're accessible in the statement. So this is how you can time user-defined functions. And then if you execute it, then you, then you see that it actually works. There we go. So now these are our five repeats of the grid loop function. And again, it takes about 1.4 1 1 seconds here is the minimum. OK, so this, this is kind of this maybe the simplest way on how we can identify uh, slow parts of the program. But the problem is if we have, maybe we inherit a code base with thousands of lines of codes, it will be pretty slow to find out what are the slow functions in this code. And there's another technique that we could use, and that's called profiling. And profiling is a technique where you, you run your program with a profiler activated, and the profiler remembers how much time is being spent in each function that is being called, and it remembers how often each function is being called, and it creates statistics on that, and you can visualize then these statistics. So the idea is basically you run your program with a profiler activated, and you store some statistics to file, and then you can inspect that statistics, statistics, you can figure out which functions have been called, how often, how much time has been spent in each function, mm, and so on and so forth, okay? And so that gives you a very quick overview on which parts of the programs are being called how often. So there are two, there are two profiling tools that you can use in Python. One is called Profile. And profile is a pure Python implementation of a profiler. And the other one is called C profile, which is a C implementation that is basically from the API, it's, um, it's compatible to profile. And so that's uh, implemented since Python 2.5. So in particular, we have it. And so from both of these, they produce output files that we can then um, use with the pstats module to create nice reports to figure out where the slow parts are. So here's how you use profile. You call your script not just with python script.py, this is what you would normally do, but instead we now call it with python minus m profile script.py. And so this loads the profile module and it runs your script using with the with the profiler activated. You can also do it within the module. So if you don't want to execute the entire script with the profiler, but just maybe one function call, what you can do is inside your script, you just import profile. You create a new profile object. And then you call profile.run with the function that you want to have profiled. So in this case, it's my grid loop function. And then after you've run it, um, you can store the statistics into a file using the dump stats um, argument, the dump stats function. So one thing here, if you, if you run your script with a profiler activated, you will realize that the runtime is significantly higher than without the profiler. And the reason is, so I think my original quit loop function takes about two seconds or maybe three seconds. If I activate this profiler, it will suddenly take about eight seconds. And the reason is that the profiler needs to, needs, has a, a lot of overhead because it needs to count the number of function calls and it needs to measure how much time is being spent in each function. And all this, um, and, and that's the cause of this overhead. But that's fine as long as you, as long as statistics are representative, this additional overhead doesn't really matter so much. You can still trust the time that has been actually spent in the functions. So 
So there's uh, one problem with the, with, this, with the Python implementation of the profiler, and, and, that is, and that is that Python has a lot of additional overhead. It creates, creates a lot of additional overhead that you need to take into account when you, when you create these profiling statistics. And there's a simple way how you can calibrate your profiler so that it knows how much this profile, this overhead is. And the way you do that is that you call this, <coughs> once you created a profiler, you call profiler.calibrate with a number of experiments that you specify here. And then as a, as a result, you get an overhead, an overhead object. And you can pass this overhead object into your profile here. And this way you can um, yeah, yeah. You can basically um, you can tune your you can calibrate your profiler so that it it uses the correct overheads for your machine. So I've shown you one the default way of if we go back again the default um, way of running a profiler is with pia dot one. And then as a return value, you get um, um, a return ob object. But if you want to have, there's an alternative where you can call one call, and the syntax is, is different here. So here you can just pass in, rather than passing in a string, you can now pass in the function with its normal arguments. While with the normal one, you had to pass in, in a string. This is basically the same as you used exec, right, which you pass in. So it's just an, an alternative way of calling the profiler. And so once you have created your profile, you can execute statistics. You can look at statistics of your, of your runtime. And these are the, this is an example of the statistics of this grid, um, our grid loop that we've implemented. And so you can see it's, it's a big table. And um, the, really the important thing is, is happening down here, okay? So we now have, uh, what we see here is on the right-hand side, these are the function names that we are calling. And there's quite some, script, some cryptic ones, but the magic is here in these two. So there's an IPython input, and the name of the function is grid loop. So this is our grid loop function. And then the line below, we have a myfunc function, okay? And so for each of these function calls, we have some statistics. And the first column here tells us how often this function was being called. So we can tell that the grid loop function was called exactly one time, while the myfunc function was called, um, yeah, a million times, okay? And so, of course, it was ca ca called a million times because we called it for every node in our grid, right? This is where this one million time comes from. Then the next column here tells us what is the total time that was spent in, in, in a function excluding function calls to other functions, okay? So the, the grid loop function here, we spent about three seconds in that function but that does not include the calls that we made to myfunc, right? So we have three seconds in grid loop and about four, in addition, about 4.3 seconds in, in myfunc, okay? And so then we can also um, see how much time was being spent per function call. So since we called grid loop only once, these two numbers are exactly the same, but um, actually the, function call for my func per function call is almost zero because the total time is about four seconds, but we called it a million times. So if you divide four by a million, you get a very small number, okay? And then the next column here is the cumulative time. So this is now the time that is being spent inside a function, including function calls. So the total time that was spent in grid loop was about 7.3 seconds, and the total time that was spent in my func was about 4.3 seconds. And so note that this number and this number here is the same, 
because my func doesn't make doesn't make any function calls anymore, right? And then again, this is again the cumulative time per function call. And so, if you now look at these numbers, right? So basically, we're interested we're basically interested in the total time in this in the second column here. And you can see that most of the numbers are zero. We have we have a little bit of um, a non-zero value here. This is num this is when we call numpy dot zeros. So initializing initializing this is the initializ initialization of our A matrix, which was quite large, right? And you can see that it takes about 0.002 seconds. But really, most of the time here is spent in the grid loop and in the myfunc. And all the rest is basically negligible. OK. So here again, the statistics of the header definitions. This is just for you as a reference. So here, just written out what all these columns mean in the statistics. So you can um, look them up when you have your own statistics. OK, so then there's the C profile module. It works basically exactly like the profile module, except that it's implemented in C, and that it has smaller a smaller performance impact than the profile. So in particular, you don't need to do this overhead calibration anymore. So I mean, basically, it's a guideline. I recommend you to just use C profile, and then you can you don't need to worry about um, technical technical details like the overhead anymore. But otherwise, it, otherwise, it works exactly the same. So um, when we use um, instead of just importing profile, we can now import C profile, and then call the one method in exactly the same way as we did before. And so here we run this foo function, and we store the statistics to file immediately, and the output file will be gridloop.prof. Or you can also call it directly from Python. So you just call python minus m c profile, and then the script name. OK, so now I've shown you this. There was the simple trick on how you can um, Immediately after you've executed the profiler, you can call this re results, which is the, the return value of the profiler, dot print starts. And this um, just prints out a standard statistics. But there's also the pstats module that allows you to um, play around with the statistics a bit um, more in detail. So. In particular, it also allows you to load in profiles that you have written to file. So you can, you can write out, when you run your program, you can write out this, the profiling statistics, maybe into different files for the different parts of your program. And then afterwards, after you've run your program, you can go ahead and load in these statistics again. And for example, here, sort the statistics by the, by the time, and then print only the three most significant uh, parts of that, of the statistics. So here you can see now, I've, if I look at the output here, it's exactly the same as before. I've just sorted it by, by the total time here, and I've cut off the output after three lines. And so now I can immediately tell, okay, the biggest one is here my funk, the next one is grid loop, and the last one is zeros, and everything below will be smaller than 0 0.002 seconds which I don't care about. So this is just a simple way on how you can um, inspect the statistics that you created in more detail. So as I mentioned, so this sort stats here, you can use to sort your statistics. You can basically use any of the columns that, you, that we have here. So you can use calls, which will be the, the first one cumulative, which will be the cumulative time, or the time, which will be the total time here. Or you can use an argument to print stats. When you just pass in a number in here, then it will limit the number of outputs to the number that you provided. OK, so let's go back to our case study, and let's see what we've learned. So 
when I won this, when I won the program with profile, the total one time is about 8.1 seconds. And we figured out that grid loop takes, of that grid loop takes about 41% of the total one time. And this my fun call contributes about 55% of the total one time. So the myfunc implementation is fairly straightforward. It's, it was just a one-line implementation. So it might be a bit difficult to actually make this faster, right? But what about grid loop? So grid loop was quite, quite complex. And so we have a lot of lines here. And it's not immediately evident. So we know that a lot of sp time is spent on here. But it's not entirely clear where exactly we need to improve, uh, where, we, we, where we need to improve our implementation. So it would be really useful if we could just say for each line how much time was spent on that line, right? Because then we could just pinpoint it down to the line where all the time is spent. And that's exactly the idea of the line by line profiler. So there's this module called line profiler that runs a, a Python function, and it tells you for each line in the Python function how much time was spent in there. This is how you use it. You install, well, first of all, you have to ins install the line profiler. You can just do it with pip. And then you go to the function that, that you want to have profiled, and you add this line at profile. And so this is a decorator that tells the line profiler that you're interested in this function and that it should inspect this function. And then you run this, then you run your program with the kern prof, with, with the kern prof um, uh, uh, command. And so, yeah, this is basically the way you run it, where quit to the line profiler is the script that you're interested in. So let's do that. It goes ahead, and here we go. So this is now the output of our line profiler. And the way you need to read this now is that on the right-hand side, you have your implementation. Right. So this is exactly the implementation of the quit loop that I have. And then on the left-hand side, you can see um, the statistics on, of each line. And so immediately here, if I look at the percentage of the time, you can see that the first lines don't contribute to the runtime at all. And it's these, these lines in here. So the lines inside the loop that, that cause all the, the, the time. Right? So here we have 16.5% in the, in the inner for loop, then 20% time for extracting the y coordinate, and then 64% time to call the function and to update our A. Away. And we also have additional statistics here where we can see how often each line was called and so on. So this is kind of a really useful tool to, to inspect what's going on in your program. And so, OK, so we looked at this. And so the question is, OK, we have this loop, right? And, and we know that now we know, OK, the loop is slow. Um, so if you want to make our program faster, we need to make the loop faster, or best, we just avoid the loop. Right? And we know how we can avoid loop, loops with NumPy. And we can use um, vectorization to do that. And so now we can go ahead and re-implement our grid loop function. And we can now use a vectorized version of our grid loop function, which I've done here. So rather than implementing the loop itself, I now use pass in um, entire vectors to f and make use of the fact that f will apply, will apply itself component-wise on each part of, of these vectors. So this is now my vectorized solution. And so now I can time it again. So I called my vectorized solution vectorized grid 2D. 
And so now I can go ahead and use the time it. Okay, let's define it. And so now I can use my uh, time it module to time it again. And voila, the time now is down to 0.019 seconds down here. And so if we compare this again with our original implementation, where we had around 1.5 seconds, OK? And so at least when I did this the first time, I got an, a speed up of over 70 times based on that. OK, so I think, yeah, that was it. Are there any questions regarding profiling? All clear? OK, then let's start again at quarter past. <laughs>